That may be the greatest catch I've ever seen in my life. All right, so I know it's always fun to focus in on the top guys. I know it's fun to focus in on the hits, the guys that were drafted a little bit later on, and that completely smashed. I mean, uh, A.J. Brown, a D.K. Metcalf, I mean, those players are very exciting to look at and go, okay, what did we miss here? I, I mean, what did we miss with these guys that were undervalued in fantasy drafts? But what may be even more useful is us going through and us looking at the players that we missed on the exact opposite direction. Now, I wasn't necessarily high on all of these guys compared to consensus. Now, I'll say there is one guy at the very end we'll get to, and he's still going to break out. I'll give my case for that at the end. But the dynasty community was so high on these running backs. All of them at their own respective peaks were seriously considered core pieces of dynasty contending rosters, dynasty juggernaut rosters. So let's talk about these guys. Let's talk about what went wrong. But of course, before we get into it, I have to make the announcement. This Saturday, June 19th, Austin, Texas, we have our official flock meetup at Zilker Park at 6 p.m. Literally, you don't have to do anything. All you have to do, show up. It'll be a ton of fun there. I'll probably bring spike ball. We'll probably bring a football or do something. Just hang out, talk, but I'm moving to Florida. So this is going to be our one shot to have that Texas flock meetup. So if you want to meet us, if you want to meet the community, come out. Austin, Texas, 6 p.m. Zilker Park, June 19th. Be there. All right. So let's get into it and let's bring up the first running back who a lot of people are speculating is going to be a cut candidate this offseason. Let's talk about Sony Michelle here. And so, of course, we are going to be talking about what these running backs did to exactly bust in their NFL careers or at least what they did to be considered bust. But the benchmarks, we are going to be looking at them for prospects coming into the NFL. There are four boxes that we always check when we go through and we try to grade these running back prospects. Now, if y'all have the chance to read our Dynasty Rookie Draft Guide over there on Patreon, you know that we did that historical research. I laid it all out there explaining why these are the boxes that we are looking for with graphs, with literally everything that I can say. But when we identified what a top 12 running back looks like, there were minimum thresholds that we had across four different categories. The first one is going to be draft capital. Now, draft capital is so important at the running back position. More important at the running back position than wide receiver, than tight end, because at running back, what you need is opportunity first. You need to make sure you're going to get an opportunity to start. Very rarely are you ever finding a player drafted on day three ever getting a real shot to be a starting running back. And usually when they are, even if they're successful, I mean, even if you have an undrafted free agent, James Robinson successful, hey, what happens? It doesn't matter because they do not have the team investment. The team can move on from them anytime. So that's the first box that we want to check. All of these boxes are going to be checked across all these running backs. But there are three more that you need to check. You need to see a college target share of 8.5%. Now, I know we got that number through that research you can find on our Dynasty Rookie Draft Guide. And that is going to be the minimum threshold to classify a running back as someone who can catch passes on third down. We also need a minimum speed threshold, which we identified as a very low bar at a 460 40-yard dash. And we need a BMI threshold of 30.0 that should say that this running back can be used on all three downs. Now, obviously, we go a little bit more in depth on our Dynasty Rookie Draft Guide, laying down the context behind every prospect coming in. You can't just look at numbers, but numbers are going to be extremely important here. Now, with Sony Michelle, we go through these boxes. Sony Michelle was right there at the thresholds with a couple things. Obviously, he gets drafted in the first round by the Patriots. He checks that box. He smashes that box. But that college target share, no siree. Now, here he was at 7.8% for his college target share. Now, we have to put a little bit of context behind this. Sony Michelle in that Georgia backfield with Nick Chubb, with a true freshman, DeAndre Swift. So, obviously, it's a little bit harder to see Sonny Michelle get that college target share. But Sonny Michelle was actually the pass catching running back on Georgia that year when Nick Chubb was the first and second down grinder. Now, Sonny Michelle clears the 40 time threshold with a 454, and he barely misses the BMI threshold. This is another threshold he misses with 29.8. So, there are two thresholds here he misses that is going to be notable going forward and trying to look at those prospects that are coming into the 2021 draft class. But with Sonny Michelle, what exactly went wrong here? Because in 2018, he got the opportunity on a per-game basis. 
I mean, this is a running back that got 16 carries per game, which, yeah, I mean, if you get drafted in the first round, you were going to get that opportunity. You were going to get that chance to shine. And with 16 carries per game, he was still the running back 34 in fantasy this year on a per game basis. And it's because this is someone who didn't reach that college target share that you look for, indicating that he can be used as a pass catching running back at the NFL level. So because he didn't reach that, he ends up having a 0.53 reception mark per game at the NFL level, which clearly tanks the amount of yards you're expecting per game because we know receptions are going to be so much more efficient at converting over to yards than what you're finding with carries. And also not really a massive touchdown score with the volume. So He's the running back 34 that year. And in 2019, it gets even worse. I mean, in 2019, you see the volume stay about the same. I mean, a 15.4 carry mark, 0.75 reception. So really nothing changing there. A running back that's only being used on the first two downs. And the problem is when you're a running back being used on only first and second down, unless you're walking away with 16 touchdowns, unless you are a Derrick Henry, Nick Chubb type athlete, you simply have no shot to be fantasy viable. Now here, because even with him getting 15 carries a game, he averages 63 total yards a game, has seven total touchdowns on the season, not a bad mark, but he's the running back 43 in fantasy. So this is why that college target share is so, so, so important. I mean, in 2020, you just see the complete fall off. I mean, they start phasing him out because he's ineffective. He actually has his best efficiency season where he averages eight and a half carries, about the same amount of receptions, about the same amount of yards with way less carries, which is notable, and two touchdowns for a good running back 61 finish. So looking back at Sony Michelle, the prospect, what we need to look at is the fact that he was not a pass catching running back at any point. And this doesn't bode well for a running back that I want to say has a ton of potential if he ever gets the opportunity in the Chuba Hubbard. That is going to be kind of the correlating factor here is that college target percentage. But still, I mean, going forward, I think that Chuba Hubbard does have that upside. But nonetheless, let's go down to our next guy, someone who actually got cut this offseason. Let's talk about Carryon Johnson. So Carryon Johnson, if y'all don't remember him coming out of Auburn, was exciting with Gary on Johnson. You had him at an extremely young age. I believe he was 20 years old coming into the NFL draft. If memory serves now with carry on, I mean, a couple of boxes were not checked here. I mean, he did not have the requisite BMI. He had a 28.9 overall BMI mark. He did meet the minimum threshold on speed with a four, five, two, and he barely missed the college target share with an 8.3%. Now he does get the draft capital being drafted with the 11th pick in the second round. But here, it's a sad story with Carryon Johnson, as you see his NFL career kind of be riddled by injuries, but you actually saw this as well in college. This is something that was a concern with Carryon Johnson, where in 2018, he suffers a knee sprain that keeps him out six games. But in 2018, he was highly productive. Now, this is kind of what's scary because we know once you see that rookie season production, a running back value goes through the roof. I mean, think about the dynasty value right now of a Cam Akers. And I'm not saying at all that carry on Johnson and Cam Akers are the same player, but I'm just saying that these guys that I myself want to come out and just say are completely safe assets for the next five years, maybe they're not as safe as we want to think. Now with carry on Johnson, he was actually the running back 18 in points per game. He gets almost 12 carries a game, but more importantly, three receptions. So you see that he is a lot closer to that minimum threshold that we have with that college target share. Also 85 total yards a game, four total touchdowns, but he really didn't get that massive jump up because you see they limit him to 11 and a half carries a game. Given the fact that we don't see that massive BMI, we don't have that 31.0 BMI that you have with a guy like David Montgomery, which should indicate that he is going to be getting pretty much every single carry in that backfield. Now, in 2019, you do see a massive fall off. He gets a bump up in carries, but for whatever reason, the usage in the receiving game is completely tanked, where all of a sudden he's getting 14 carries a game, a little over one reception a game for 66 total yards. So yeah, he's tanked down to the running back 32, but he also has that meniscus tear in 2019. And in 2020, they go out, they draft DeAndre Swift, they bring in Adrian Peterson, and he is completely erased from every dynasty owner's mind as if this was not a player that was going extremely high in startup drafts in 2018 as well as 2019. So with Gary on Johnson, what we need to know is this is another running back that does not check every box. Now, the running backs that do check every box in this year's NFL draft is you have a guy like Travis Etienne. I don't, I don't want to talk about him too much. Travis Etienne, li listen up. I know this may sound like some ASMR, but I want this to come across. Travis Etienne, Najee Harris, checking every single one of these boxes we are going to be talking about. So keep that in mind going forward. 
Now, Royce Freeman going to be that next running back in that draft class actually goes at the top of the third round, but in most dynasty drafts, he was going a lot higher than some of these other running backs based on the fact that some dynasty analysts were all in on Royce Freeman coming out of Oregon. Now, Freeman himself actually crushes that BMI mark where he had a 31.1 BMI also has the requisite speed that you're looking for with a 454. But hey, that college target share, simply not there. Another one of these guys that doesn't meet the minimum threshold on what you would expect for his receiving down usage. Now, I will say that, I mean, it's hard to say exactly what happens with Royce Freeman because he gets to the NFL in his rookie season. I mean, just someone you're not starting at all. Nine carries a game, a reception, 42 total yards. So this is someone that just completely gets the job stolen from him by Philip Lindsay. Never even really has the job. Now, what I'm interested to see is I'm interested to see that in 2019, you actually have Royce Freeman coming out and only getting eight carries a game, which you would not necessarily expect from his prospect profile. And another thing you wouldn't expect is the fact that he got two and a half receptions a game. So that's a decent amount of receptions. I mean, if you're drafting a running back that's going to be getting 2.7 receptions a game, I'm completely fine with that player in fantasy. Yet this is someone that didn't meet our minimum threshold for his college target share. So that is interesting. Obviously, just not enough touches in the offense to ever really be anything of value for fantasy leagues. Now in 2020, he gets completely erased with Melvin Gordon coming in, this turning in to a Melvin Gordon and Philip Lindsay show. But Royce Freeman, another one of these guys that, hey, he comes in, he doesn't check every one of the boxes and the NFL and as well as the dynasty community value him way too highly. I know a lot of people just assumed he was going to be a workhorse running back. It did not happen. Now, our next player, we're going to keep this very brief, TJ Yeldon. Okay, so here with TJ Yeldon, I know we're going to a couple draft classes back, but he was drafted at the very top of the second round. And here, another player that doesn't meet every minimum threshold. I mean, here, he had a 7.5 college target share, doesn't meet the threshold there. He had a 29.8 BMI, doesn't meet the threshold there. And he had a 461 40 yard dash. So this is something I want to talk about. So you see TJ Yeldon, and he's pretty much at the mark for every threshold. I mean, he is right there with everything. But the problem is when those thresholds are set, usually the running backs that go through and they succeed, even if they're close to the threshold, they are elite in other categories. So you can have a running back that is right there, almost about to hit the BMI mark. But if he doesn't necessarily pass it with wide margin, then you better expect that player to be extremely fast. You better expect that player to be a great receiving running back. It's kind of the problem that we currently have with a Michael Carter Jr., with the Michael Carter Jr., yeah, he is right there with so many of these key boxes that we look for. Yet the fact is, I mean, you can be right there on one of them as long as you're crushing the others. And that's not the case. I mean, with TJ Yeldon, he comes in 2015 is rookie season. He has a good year. I mean, he's the running back 18 in points per game. And then in 2016, it all falls apart. I mean, 2016 jump drops down to being the running back 44. And then we all know 2017, they decide to draft Leonard Fournette over Patrick Mahomes, over Deshaun Watson. So that was the story with TJ Yeldon. But I think that's kind of the lesson to be learned with a, maybe a player like Michael Carter Jr., also someone that didn't even have the same type of NFL draft capital. Now, our last player we are going to be talking about is someone that, yes, he busted as hard as everybody else. But if you look at the prospect profile, there is no reason for this player to not hit in the NFL. So Rashad Penny. Now with Rashad Penny, I stand by the fact, y'all know we were very high on him in that 2018 NFL draft class. Now, if you go through these boxes, I mean, he was drafted in the first round by the Seahawks. He ran a 4-4-6 40-yard dash, which is a fantastic mark. He has a 10.3% college target share. He had a BMI well over 30. Rashad Penny not only checked every single one of these boxes, he cleared them with wide margin. Rashad Penny, I would make the argument, was a better draft prospect than Najee Harris. And I know a lot of people are going to hate to hear that. I know so many people are going to hate to hear that especially with Rashad Penny. Now that we have that hindsight bias, because we can go back and we go, Hey, well, Rashad Penny's been horrible since he had entered the NFL. But I mean, we go through and I'll say, yes, I agree. He's been horrible in fantasy, but in 2018, the limited role that he had, he was highly efficient. I mean, he averaged six carries a game, half a reception, and he averaged close to five yards per carry. And I know, trust me, guys, I understand yards per carry is a very poor stat to evaluate running backs with everything that goes into the running back situation and how that translates to production. But it's at least a starting point. It's at least a very simple gauge to look at. Now in 2019, he averages six and a half carries 
averages close to a reception a game, and he bumps up the efficiency to close to six yards per carry. This is what I'm focusing on. I mean, he looks like a very talented running back. The problem is Chris Carson was just too damn good to get him on the field. And he also has suffered injuries throughout his entire NFL career. I mean, we go to 2018, he suffers a knee sprain, keeps him out of two games. In 2019, he has a hamstring strain that keeps him out of three games. And then he goes through and completely destroys his knee with an ACL tear and as well as a meniscus tear. So a disgusting injury that kept him out of all of 2020. But we're looking at this and we go, at least he has an excuse. At least you can point to the injury excuse where you don't necessarily have that with the other teams that I know a lot of people are going to be saying, but Mason, they didn't pick up his fifth year option. Of course they didn't pick up his fifth year option. Nobody was expecting Rashad effing Penny to get his fifth year option picked up. I mean, are you going to be paying a running back that salary that literally has not had a single good season in the NFL? No, you don't pay running backs in the NFL, let alone running backs that have been disappointing. So of course he's not getting that contract picked up. But here with Rashad Penny, I will say he's the one guy that it's gone wrong so far, but I'm holding out hope because we go through in every other one of these running backs that busted in the NFL, they got the opportunity, they failed with the opportunity, and it was taken away from them. Now, in the case of Rashad Penny, every time that he is given a chance, he has succeeded with what has been asked. And he has been limited on his chances based on the play of Chris Carson, as well as Rashad Penny's own injury history. So I am viewing Rashad Penny this year as obviously someone that has no chance of stealing that job from Chris Carson. But he's going to be in that same light for me as a Latavius Murray, as a player like a Tony Pollard, as someone that we know has the talent. And if an injury happens ahead of him, he can be vaulted up into a situation where he can be a three down running back and succeed. And Chris Carson, hey, a uh, little known fact, hasn't necessarily been the healthiest running back throughout his NFL career. And also, this is a fantastic situation in Seattle with, if not a top three quarterback in the NFL, at the minimum, a top 10 quarterback in the NFL with Russell Wilson. So Rashad Penny, I'm holding out hope. I know I'm probably irrational, but we're going through this entire list and we're going, okay, player X didn't hit because X, Y, and Z. Player Y didn't hit because X, Y, and Z. Rashad Penny? Uh, can we point to really anything is I, no, we, we can't. He was a fantastic prospect. Give the man a chance. Now, thank you, my dudes. I really hope that this video helped. I really hope that maybe you were able to go through and use this video for your own prospect evaluation with how you're viewing some of these running backs coming into the NFL. But yeah, of course, go down there, drop a like, leave a comment, subscribe to the channel. It helps us out a ton. And I'll see y'all with the video tomorrow. I want to thank everybody who has recently decided to join the flock in Alex, Jack, Bud, Kevin, Connor, Caesar, Jonathan, Joseph, Jordan, and James. Thank you, my dudes.